I've been crucified with Christ I've been crucified with Christ I no longer live but Christ lives in me We welcome you to our Bible study today The Apostolic Doctrine of Eschatology Today's subject we're going to be talking about a question And that question is Did Jesus return in the year A.D. 70 of the first century. What do the scriptures say? One of the basic tenets of hermeneutics, which is the science of the common sense science of interpretation of scripture, is that of audience relevance. To understand the scriptures, we must first understand what those scriptures meant to the original audience. The scriptures were written to them, about them, for them and about the events that were getting ready to take place in their lifetime. There can be little doubt that the writers of the epistles expected Jesus coming to be soon. If words like near, soon, and at hand are to have any meaning at all, they cannot be understood to mean that event is hundreds or even thousands of years away. The strongest possible evidence remains Jesus' own words. His time statements. He didn't leave any doubts. His words were clear and they were concise. They were not conditional. He didn't say maybe or possibly or someday or in 2,000 years or in 10,000 years. Jesus spoke in a very plain, straightforward manner to the ordinary people of his day. His words are some of the clearest in the New Testament if we take them at face value. If we try to make them mean something else other than what they say, it all becomes confusing. As we read through these next few verses, ask yourself, if you had been living in that first century, how would you have understood concerning the time of Jesus coming again? To support the idea of the future second coming of Jesus when neither Jesus nor the apostles spoke of that, nor is it found in the scriptures. That is to promote error. There are many people today, though they hold to this idea because of a lifetime of doctrinal conditioning and not from the Bible. This is a classic case of man-made tradition nullifying the word of God and making it have no effect in our lives. We are to be governed by scripture, the inspired word of truth. Remember, when there is confusion, it is because traditions seek to alter the original meaning of a Bible, a Bible truth. A Bible that can mean anything is a Bible that simply has no meaning. Here are some examples of scriptures that speak about the return of Jesus in the first century in the year A.D. 70. In Matthew chapter 24 and verse 30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Now you got to remember, the we was them, those to whom Paul the Apostle was speaking to. In Revelation chapter 20 and verse 12, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books, according to their works. Now remember, eschatology is all about the last things of the old covenant that God had with the nation of Israel. Eschatology is the study of the last days, generation. There were going to be three things that were going to happen when Jesus returned. Number one, there was going to be a resurrection of the dead. Number two, there was going to be a day of judgment. And number three, it was going to be the return of the Lord Jesus Christ 
that was going to bring these things to a finality, to an end. Jesus came and fulfilled the high priest typology. He came in the last days. The resurrection was on the last day of the last days. That last days period was in the first century. It's reasoned that if the nature of these events is literal, then the time of their fulfillment is obviously in the future. But when you look at the scriptures, the scriptures are very plain, very right to the point about the time statements that Jesus spoke out was going to be in that generation. He said all these things are going to happen before this generation passes away. That 40-year generation came to a complete end in the year A.D. 70. Here are some other scriptures that speak about the return of Jesus. In Romans chapter 13, verse 11 and 12. And that, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Now that scripture is simply saying the time is now. The day is at hand. They were expecting the Lord to return. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 29 and 31. But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none, and they that use this world as not abusing it, but the fashion of this world passeth away. Now again, we see the scriptures tell us that the time is short. The time is at hand. The fashion of this world is passing away. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11, another scripture. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. That's a pretty plain statement, upon whom the ends of the age are come. In Philippians chapter 4 and 5, another statement that tells us about the immediacy of the return of Jesus Christ. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. What could be more plainer than that? The coming of the Lord is at hand. It was at hand in the first century. It was at hand in that period of time from 30 A.D. to A.D. 70. And in A.D. 70, the end, the end came. In James chapter 5, verse 8 and verse 9, be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Now in John, Jesus said, For judgment am I come into this world. The time was drawing nigh. The judge was standing before the door. That's how close the time was. In 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Now Peter was speaking to his generation. The end of all things was at hand. Not the end of the physical world but the end of everything that had to do with God's old covenant relationship with the twelve tribes of Israel. Everything was coming to a close. The end of that covenantal relationship was at hand. That's why he said, the end of all things is at hand. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 18, Little children, it is the last time. And as you have heard, that Antichrist should come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. Now the Apostle John said this almost 2,000 years ago. There were many Antichrists. 
He said, that's how we know that we're in the last time. That last part of those last days was close at hand. Today, futurism has the Antichrist as a single individual coming onto the scene in the end of the so-called physical world. But John the Apostle said, no, the Antichrist is here now. There are many of them. In 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 17, another scripture that denotes the urgency and the nearness of the end of the last days and the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if, if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Now the house of God that Peter is talking about was the temple that was there in Jerusalem. But there are some things that we never hear when preachers talk about this scripture today, and that is simply the first few words of that scripture. Notice what it said. For the time is come, the time is here, the time is present, that judgment will begin at the house of God. And that was the judgment that God came to bring upon the nation of Israel. Why? It's because they broke the everlasting covenant that he made with them at Mount Sinai. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 37, another scripture that speaks about the nearness of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. So often today we hear preachers contradict that scripture. The saying, if the Lord tarries, is a saying that's common. It's been said for many, many, many years. But the Bible said, he that will come, shall come, and will not tarry. There again, a contradiction of things that are being taught in churches today. For nearly 2,000 years, the vast majority of churches today are still waiting eagerly, expecting and still proclaiming the soon and any moment return of Jesus Christ back into this world, all the while struggling with the dilemma of non-occurrence, non-occurrence as to what the scriptures have said, all the while trying to maintain the pretense of inerrancy, of infallibility, and the inspiration of scripture. On the other hand, many Bible scholars are now saying that Jesus has delayed or even postponed His second coming. They reckon Jesus and the New Testament writers were simply mistaken or deluded. There are some people who think Jesus never made certain time-restricted statements in the Scriptures, but that some of those words were altered or later added by His followers. Such conclusions spread like a cancer and opened the door to question the authenticity of many other things that Jesus said. Even the, the whole issue of Bible inerrancy. The Bible is perfect. Every word of God is perfect. There are no mistakes. Most Christians today don't seem to realize the predicament that we are in if Jesus has not come in the time perimeters He Himself specified. The apparent failure of these prophecies to come true has led to skepticism about the reliability of the Bible and the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. The past fulfillment of eschatology is the only thing that solves this problem and by maintaining that these prophecies were in fact fulfilled and have a first century fulfillment. Past fulfillment. There's where the answers lie to your questions. Not in the future, but the answers to your questions are in the past. Remember, the Bible is a book about covenant people. Paramount faith is the faith that is founded on Scripture, no matter who or what condition or circumstance. Jesus told the Pharisees, the highest religious order of His day, in Matthew 22 and 29. Jesus answered and said unto them, 
Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. The most common error in understanding the scriptures is allowing contextual inconsistencies to exist. Such errors clearly reveal the lack of Bible study and understanding. The aim is often to support tradition, tradition over scriptures, and thereby allowing misinterpretation of a verse to contradict other verses. Hermeneutics is the science of interpretation, and the analogy of faith is that no scripture can negate any other scripture, because scripture never contradicts scripture. Honoring the context of the scriptures to the original readers is critical to proper biblical interpretation. Remember, almost right is always wrong. The hope of eternal life to those first century Christians was indeed wonderful. Today, we have the assurance. They were looking and had the hope for it, but we have the assurance today of eternal life. A hope that is never realized can lead to cynicism, despair, and disillusionment. The book of Proverbs chapter 13 verse 12 said that hope deferred makes the heart sick. If we believe the words of Jesus and we understand them to be spiritual truths, then we can be sure that God has told us everything in the Bible that we need to know. Remember, what a person believes affects the way he lives. That's why it's so important that we seek to find and to know the truth or else we may believe the wrong things and make wrong decisions. A simple-minded man believes everything, but a prudent man, he checks it out. In Proverbs chapter 13, verse 16, Every prudent man dealeth with knowledge, but a fool layeth open his folly. And in Proverbs chapter 14, and verse 15, The simple believeth every word, but the prudent man looketh well to his going. In Hosea, chapter 4 and verse 6, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. The knowledge of God's word is simply knowing the facts. What are the facts? The word of God. Those are the facts. Those are the words that God has inspired the apostles to write and put in a book so that we might always have a reference point. Knowledge produces life eternal. Remember, the bread of life is the word of life. Many people today are being misled and deceived because they, they never go and check it out. They never check to see whether or not the person that's teaching them or preaching to them is following the men that followed Jesus Christ. A lot of people could care less what the Bible says. They don't want to know what it means. If you are not willing to study and apply yourself, when Jesus spoke in Matthew eleven twenty nine, he said, take my yoke upon you and learn about me. Learning is a process. Learning is the acquiring of knowledge. He told us to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. A lot of people spend a lot of time going to church. Chronologically, they may be old, 40, 50, 60 years old in church, but spiritually, they're like brand new babies. I always think of the cartoon caption of an old man with a bald head and a long white beard and a diaper on, and a big hairy thumb sticking out of his mouth. That's chronological age without spiritual maturity. Take the time. Read your Bible. Study to show yourself approved. Make sure that you're following the men that followed Jesus. The Apostles' doctrine is the only doctrine that the Bible speaks of and teaches us about. There are a lot of churches today, there are a lot of preachers today 
They're all around the world. They're all saying something different. Anything that contradicts the Scripture contradicts God. Any question, you can reach us, email us at the New Covenant Apostolic Church at gmail.com. Thank you. I've been crucified with Christ.